Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Mike with the Watchman Pure Bible Study. Got my Bible, got my notes, got my got some more swine flu shot here. I just brewed some swine flu shot this morning. Hopefully now I won't get it. Although my wife has been uh, pretty sick. In fact, she missed last night's uh, Wednesday night's uh, prayer service here at our church. Uh, so you pray for her. Anyway, Second Peter chapter one. Um, Wonderful, wonderful things. I like I like going through this chapter. I like what this chapter says, and I can hardly wait till we get to verse 19. But we're going to have to because we just don't have time to do everything. But uh, remember, we were talking about the nine things in in Second Peter chapter one that if these things be in us and abound, they make us that we shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I think that we ought to know more about Jesus and learn Him and know Him and study Him and be able to recognize Him because, I mean, you've heard me before, I believe in the last days there is going to be a false Savior that uh, is, is going to be on the scene. People are going to look at Him and they're going to choose between the real one and the fake one, just like Israel did with Barabbas and Jesus, just like Adam did with the two trees. They're going to choose in the last days. And I think the, the true measure of God's people in the last days is not going to be their denominational distinction or lack thereof. Their true measure is not going to be uh, their status in the church, their board member, or even a pastor, or anything like that. It is going to be their knowledge and their understanding of the Word of God so that they are able to recognize Jesus. And this is one of the themes that Peter is setting out uh, in, in the book of Second Peter. It's the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the Lord. Uh, and it just seems like that God is preparing His people to be able to recognize Him so that we could know when the rest of the world is going to be lied to. So, um, and he says in verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So these, there are going to be people out there who uh, have, have either forgotten these things or they, have, they lack these things in their life. They are the unfruitful so-called Christians, and probably even doubtful whether they're even saved. The, the unfruitful church members, I'll say that, the unfruitful church members uh, who think they, they live however they want to, do however they want to, uh, have rock and roll concerts in the church and follow the world inside the church and believe that everything's going to be okay, these people are blind. And because they're blind, they will not be able to see the difference. One of the things that I've taught over the years, one of the things God has shown me uh, in the pages of the Bible is this theme of drunkenness. Remember, Babylon holds a cup in her hand full of the abomination of the filthiness uh, of her fornication. She has committed fornication with people. She's committed fornication, spiritual fornication with kings, with nations, and I believe today with churches as well. And people, there's a constant theme in the Bible about drunkenness. And uh, God told the priest not to be drunk. And the reason why was, is that the priest had a job, and that, re- that job had a requirement. And the requirement was, is that they had to have the ability, when someone brought a sacrifice in, they had to have the ability to determine whether or not that sacrifice was clean or unclean. And if they were drunken uh, through wine and strong drink, they would not be able to tell the difference, and they therefore would allow the tabernacle, the temple, which you know now is the human body, to be defiled. And so, uh, he that lack of these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Now, verse 10 is what I want to concentrate on today. Wherefore the rather, brethren. Now, this wherefore, I, I like this. I like this term wherefore and um, therefore in the Bible, in the King James. I don't think you ought to retranslate it. It just messes the whole thing up. Uh, it's always, there's always a, um, it, in Paul's writing, in Peter's writing especially, there's always like a, a list of facts and then there's a summation of facts. It's like these guys are, are lawyers in a courtroom and they're, they're pleading with the jury or they're, plead, they're giving their pleadings with the judge. Uh, So they lay out the evidence. They lay out the facts. Paul all the time was laying out the evidence uh, based upon the law. Paul knew the law very well and probably was in in his day a good lawyer, brilliant lawyer. But he knew the law very well. And uh, he he was always laying down the case that the law 
proved Jesus Christ. And so he said, what, you know, you'll see Paul say, what shall we say about this then? What shall we say about these things? He was trying to make a summation as a lawyer in a courtroom would uh, of the facts to lead you to a conclusion, to draw you to make the right conclusion. Peter's doing the same thing here. He gives all these things in verses 1 through 9. He says, wherefore the rather, and, and actually he's, he's actually contrasting what he's saying against what he said in verse 9. Verse 9, he said, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. So, uh, if you will permit me to be a little blunt, there are stupid people and there are smart people. Or let me, let me change that. There are ignorant people, the Bible says. And there are wise people. The ignorant people are the people who refuse the Bible. They refuse the the unaltered, um, uncorruptible Word of God. They refuse that in their life. They are ignorant. They are ignoring the facts, okay? Uh, Then there is the wise, those who freely accept what the Bible has. Those who freely accept that the Bible is the Word of God. It's not to be changed. It's not to be retranslated. It doesn't need our approval. It doesn't need our wisdom added to it. It just is the Word of God. And so Peter's giving you the contrast here, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election Sure, if there's anything that I've ever realized about the Christian life, I am, uh, I'm, how old am I now? It's, let me get another swine flu shot here so I can remember how. I'm 43 years old, and uh, one of the things that I've learned in 43 years of life uh, is that it takes diligence. It takes diligence, number one, just to make sure the devil's not climbing all over my back. It takes diligence. It takes diligence to maintain a great relationship with my wife. It, it, takes, it takes work. You have to remember that God has appointed us to these days of labor. Everything that we do in life that we hold dear, it's, it's, we're going to have to work for it. We're going to have to earn it. Uh, when my wife and I first got married, we were so in love, okay? So we didn't have to earn anything. As the years go by, as the uh, problems arise in my life, as the problems arise in her life, we realized that it takes work to be able to deal with each other, to be able to love one another, to be able to care about one another, uh, to be able to give ourselves one to another uh, in all realms of life, it takes work and it takes diligence. It takes diligence uh, to maintain a good marriage. It takes diligence to, uh, it takes diligence if you're going to do a job, work or work. It, it takes diligence to do those things. Our country, and I'll just be dead honest with my opinion, one of the reasons why we have lost out in this country as far as our dominance in the manufacturing uh, realm or anything like that is that, by and large, we have lost our diligence in this country. We have lost uh, the American worker. I'm not saying all of them, but some of them. The, the American worker has decided that uh, it's better off for him to do less work and get paid more money. Uh, whereas in other countries, these people are just glad to have a job and they'll do anything in the world to keep that job because they don't have anything else. And so it takes diligence to work a job. I encourage our young people in our church uh, from, from a very young age on up through teenage years and on up uh, once they get into adulthood is that it, it should never be said that a young person out of our church was fired from a job because of laziness. Um, I teach our young people to, if they, if they get hired, to go to work and to work with their hands and to, and to be diligent about their work, um, to, get, to get the raises, to get the promotions, uh, to, to do those things. It takes diligence. But it also takes diligence, it takes diligence in our churches uh, to maintain the, the steadfast course that God has required us on. Um, it takes diligence in those areas of life. And so he's telling us, uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, 
here's this is this is this is uh, this is good because I, I want you to get this. Uh, we are a watchman ministry. Our job is to watch to see what's going on in the world, to see what's going on uh, in the church, uh, to be diligent about that. But ultimately, I cannot, um, I won't be held accountable um, if some church goes off the deep end and, uh, and, and they start flying off on all these emerging church new age stuff. I, I'm not responsible for that. The pastor and the people of that church are responsible for that. If Ultimately, my children, and I've, I've tried my best, probably failed more times than I've succeeded, uh, at, at raising my children in a Christian home, in a Christian environment, teaching them right from wrong, teaching them that church is not just Sunday morning. It's Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meeting. I mean, that's what church is to them. If at some point my children uh, in their adult age make a choice that is contrary to what I taught them, I will feel lousy about that, but ultimately it's not my responsibility. It's not they made a choice. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is the gift of choice, the freedom of, of our will to act according to what we see and to what we really believe. That's a gift that God gave us. God Here again, back to that choice, the tree of knowledge uh, of good and evil and the tree of life. And God said them both, if you look in Genesis, He said them both in the midst of the garden. And God said, choose, pick one. I'm telling you, stay away from this one. That's a commandment. Don't eat this one, you'll die. But He set them there in front of Him. He didn't place a big barrier around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't set it up on a mountain somewhere out in the cold or hide it in a cave anywhere. He put it right there in front of Him. And the only barrier in Adam's mind was the barrier of the consequences of the law. And so, and all through the Bible you see that, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord. Uh, choose life. God gives us that choice and God has given you a choice right now uh, on where you're going to spend eternity. Life is that one big chance uh, to make the decision that you're going to follow God. Um, I met a lady a long time ago. I loved her dearly, but she and I disagreed. She said that she didn't believe in deathbed confessions. She did not believe that a person could be on their deathbed uh, and be conscious and know that they're going to die and pray and ask God to forgive them and they would go to heaven. She said, I don't believe in that. And, I, and, I just, and it threw me for a minute and I had to think about it. And I thought about it for a long time and I'm going, you know what? Life is one, cho one long big choice. You've got a choice in life to make the decision whether or not you want to live in heaven or whether or not you want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and they pun be punished in the torments of hell. You have that choice. Uh, and it's nobody else's responsibility, but it is yours. Ezekiel 33 in the chapter on the watchman, uh, he's telling them, he said, if, you know, if the sword comes, Son of Man, I set you as a watchman. If the sword come and you warn not the people, they're going to die for their own iniquity. It was their choice. Now, you had a responsibility to warn them and blow the trumpet. If you blew that trumpet, then you're absolved from that guilt. If they die in their iniquity and they heed not the warning, that's not your monkey, God said. That's theirs. They made the choice. So you make the decision that you decide that you're going to follow God. At some point, at some point, and I tell people this, at some point you come to a place in your life where you said, you know what, I've had it. I've had it living for myself. I'm tired of living for the devil. I'm tired of doing everything that he says. I'm sick of it. And uh, I know where I'm going. I know where my life is headed. And this is not where I want to be. And so you make the choice that you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You, and, and it's your responsibility to be diligent to make your calling an election sure. Um, one of the things that we do that was done with me as a young man, 16 years old, in this church, um, I believe that God was calling me to, to preach the gospel. I, I hope I got that one right. I really do. Um, sometimes I've doubted it, I'll be honest with you. But God, God laid it on my heart one night. I remember the message. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Goff was preaching, um, Must Jesus Bear His Cross Alone? He was preaching on that old hymn out of our hymn books. Must Jesus Bear His Cross Alone and all the world go free? Yes, there's a cross in everyone, then there's a cross for me. And I went to the altar that night, and um, I just really believed that God was calling me to preach the gospel. 
so there was a process whereby I was set aside, like the deacons were in the book of Acts. I was set aside to make that calling and the election sure. Um, over the course of time, and it, there's been times when I wasn't sure. There's been times when I didn't pastor. When I first got married, I'd, I worked uh, in construction, drywall and painting, and all those things. I learned a trade. In case this doesn't pan out, I can always go back to my trade. Uh, but anyway, I, during that time, I didn't want to preach. And yet, there, at some point in my life, the burden just became so heavy. I told my wife, I said, I, I, I'm not going to live. I am not going to live if I don't start being obedient to the Lord's calling in my life. And God began to reveal that to me and to make it sure in my life. But it was my responsibility. It wasn't my wife's. It wasn't the church's. It wasn't the denomination's. It was my responsibility. And this is, I think this is what I want to... What I want to get across here in this, in this Bible study is that we don't like what's going on in the world. We don't like what's going on in, the, in Congress. We don't like what's going on um, in the White House. We don't like what's going on in the Supreme Court. We don't like what's going on in there's a new world order. We know uh, Television's bad. The sodomites are gaining control. They're going to pass the hate crimes bill. We know all of these things are taking place, but still and yet, when it all goes bad and we're standing before God, we will not be able to blame God, the devil, the White House, the New World Order, the Mason. We won't be able to blame anybody except us. It's your responsibility to take care of your spiritual life, the relationship that you have with you and God. It's your responsibility to repent for your sins. It's your responsibility to pray. It's your responsibility to get your Bible out and read it. It's your responsibility uh, to stay away from temptations that will cause you to sin. It's your job. Give diligence to these things to make your calling and election sure. Uh, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an interest, there is... There is coming a falling away. 2 Thessalonians. I, I just want to go read that again. Um, I just like... Uh, it, to, to me, there's so much wisdom here uh, in um, 2 Thessalonians 2. Because I believe, man, we're, we're, we're right here. We're at the decision-making time. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Uh, here again, being confident and making your calling and election sure will give you peace at night to know that you do have eternal life. You have it. Um, you know, sometimes, and, and I'm like this, and, and I suspect that probably you're like this too, because I think everybody, I think everybody's the same is that even though we try, to, we try to put on that we have all the faith in the world, the truth of it is, every now and then we get a little nervous. We get a little nervous because of things that we've done. We know we violated God's law. We know we broke His law. We know we did. And so we get a little nervous and we start doubting. We start questioning. Um, we, start, um, uh, we start thinking that maybe we're not saved. We start thinking that maybe uh, we didn't do everything right or maybe we haven't been good enough. Well, I'll tell you, nobody has. Nobody has ever been good enough. I haven't. The things that God has blessed me with in this ministry, um, I cannot, there's no way in the world I can take credit for. The credit has to go to God because that's where it came from. It didn't come from me. It wasn't my idea. Um, I gladly accepted it. But the things that have been given me by God are, are just that. They've been given to me, but not because I've earned it. Not because I worked all my life to get to the point that I'm at now. See, that's pride. The things that have been given to me have been given to me by my Father, not because I've been good, but because He loves me. And so with the making your calling and election sure, with understanding and knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're saved, then as these things take place in the world, you're not going to be soon shaken in mind. In other words, your cage is not going to be easily rattled. Um, 
you know, something, something is going to take place somewhere, probably in this country, that's going to blow everybody's mind. They're just going to freak out and not, not know how in the world. Uh, on September 11th, a precious, precious thing that happened on September 11th, 2001, when, when, when we heard word that those towers had fallen, the Pentagon had been hit, um, immediately uh, my mind is going to the scripture. I, kinda, I can kind of see what's going on here. There was a young lady, in fact, it was my niece, uh, my wife's side of the family. Uh, she called me that night just crying. And we had been witnessing her and her husband for years. Um, she said, I know I need to get saved. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. All of a sudden, planes crash. And she goes, I think I'm ready now. And she got saved that night on the, on the phone. She got saved that night. And uh, well, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, but there's, there's going to be something happen in this country that's just going to freak everybody out. And God's people who have knowledge, who are not soon shaken, who have made their calling and election sure, and have the knowledge, the remembrance of scriptures, we're going to say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet so-and-so. We're going to know those things. I believe that with all my heart. Um, he said in verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you, including Mike Hoggart. Don't you dare, don't you dare put me on a pedestal as, oh, Pastor Mike, I mean, he's got the truth. I mean, he, trust me, I want to tell the truth as far as I'm able to understand it. But I've been wrong on some things before. And I don't want to be wrong again, but I might be. If I say something and it doesn't smell right to you, I mean, I need to brush my teeth or quit using my swine flu shot. But if I say something and it just doesn't smell kosher to you, then you go back to the Word of God. Let no man deceive you by any means. And the problem that we've had in the, in the mainstream churches today is that we have put these guys up on a pedestal. We've put Billy Graham up on a pedestal. They put Benny Hinn, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Myers, they put even some of these prophecy guys up on a pedestal as if these guys have some like secret uh, line to Jesus Christ that the, none of the rest of you have. And some of these people make it sound like that they do. Some secret tap-in line to Jesus Christ. And oh, I got a revelation from God. We have, we have been guilty of elevating these people to a status that was far above what God allows for men to be elevated to. And I'm telling you that men are going to deceive people. Church men, men in the ministry are going to de are deceiving people right now. So let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. We've dealt with that on several things that we've done. The falling, the falling, the falling. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is fallen. A spirit that will lead you to fall is the spirit of Babylon the Great. The spirit that will enable you to stand is the Holy Spirit of God. This is why, and I, and I told you my testimony, this is why uh, when I was in that Pentecostal church, and, and I, I don't hate Pentecostals. I, I, I think there are some godly men and some godly churches out there. But this is why when I was in that Pentecostal church, my goodness, what was that, 16, 17 years ago? Uh, standing out in the front of that church, they came by and and I didn't fall. I know I was supposed to because, you know, that's what you do. If you go to Pentecostal church, you just plan on hitting the floor. And, uh, but I didn't fall. And I couldn't, you know, and I, and I had prayed, God, if this is for me, if this is real, then give it to me. I, I'm letting you. But if it's not, don't let me fall for it. And I didn't fall. And they, you know, kind of had my eyes closed, you know, so I can imagine them going, hmm, uh, this didn't work. Maybe he needs a little encouragement. So they came back by me again, and, you know, kind of nudged a little bit. Well, I just kind of stood, you know. Well, that's pretty good, but I didn't fall. The falling away is going to take place. And let, let me just say this, and I know there's differences of opinion to this, and I don't want to get into that, but I will tell you this. I think all of us can know and agree for a fact that there's a lot of church people that are going to fall. 
There's a lot of people sitting in churches right now. Well, maybe not right this second. But from Sunday to Sunday, there's a lot of people in churches that are going to fall. It's plain and simple. If you make your calling and election sure, what I'm telling you is you need to know whether or not you're saved. You need to know whether or not you are born again as a child of the living God. You have the assurance of your salvation. Read 1 John. Read, read whatever God tells you to read. But you have that absolute assurance of salvation. Uh, if, so if these things be in you, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to leave you with this today. Um, and we're going to get uh, next week, hopefully, into the, into the good part of First Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1. I, I like this. I like studying about it. I like talking about it because it points you to the Bible. God is a God of abundance. He's not a, he's not a poor God. He's a God of abundance. Now, the... Um, the drunken um, uh, wine bibbers of the charismatic word faith movement will tell you, well, sure, God's abundance, and He wants you to have money. God wants you to have money. They'll tell you that. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, I, I've got to a point in my life where forgiveness is a whole lot more precious than money. Eternal life is a whole lot more precious than houses and lands and cars and vacations and computers and everything else. Forgiveness and salvation and God's love and God's mercy, I am glad. The Bible says He is rich in mercy. And I don't know about you, but I'm awfully glad that my God is rich in mercy. Uh, we're going to talk about the rest of it, hopefully uh, next week. Uh, continue to pray for our ministry. I am so busy right now. I'm working on three new DVDs. Uh, the deal with uh, Dan Brown's The Lost Word. Uh, I, am, I have put so much work into these things, and you pray for me and pray for our ministry. Uh, I'm not reading a whole lot of emails right now. I'm not spending a lot of time doing that, and so I hope you understand that. Uh, but just continue to pray for us and uh, pray for our work here, and we'll pray for you. A guy called me yesterday, uh, and let me just say this. I won't say his name. I won't say the situation, but there's a man who called here yesterday wants us to pray for him and his wife who has left him. And so I'm just going to pass this along to you. Would you pray for this man? Lift him up before the Lord. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. We'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.